One of the most important things is to understand what our authority is. Are we supposed to go with our feelings and what our heart tells us? Should we trust whatever the church has to say? I believe all authority when it comes to what you believe, what you teach, how you come to faith, and how you're supposed to walk in Christ, it is supposed to come from Scripture. Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, we are going to be talking about the canon of Scripture. And we're going to be showing in Scripture why we can not only trust Scripture and why we can know what we're reading is actually what God wants us to read, what God wants us to know, and how we are I guess, to run our entire lives, right? In terms of everything that we know, in terms of an infallible authority that we can go back to in terms of life, in terms of how you walk in your faith, and in terms of how you come to salvation in Christ. And before we do that, I just want to thank everyone. If this is your first time watching on our YouTube channel, which these are all now on video, we praise God for you. Just, this is awesome that you're here. And also, if you are just listening on audio, you can catch this on video later on the Good Fight Radio Show YouTube channel. And you can also subscribe to the Good Fight Ministries page YouTube channel, which we've been coming out with more and more videos as of late. And also, if you get a chance and you would like to support the ministry, go on to patreon.com slash goodfight and become a Patreon. And you guys get some exclusive stuff as well. But the I know the main thing there is more so to help support the ministry, and you guys have done an awesome job. In fact, today, just so you know, Josh, our editor, is running all the stuff today for you guys. So if there's any mess-ups on this episode, you know who to blame because Tony is heading out of town. So we need to make sure we have someone else who can run the show when he is not here. So... With all that said, I would love to dig into the scriptures with you guys. And one of the things that is important, and I think that we always need to come to an understanding of, is whenever we're learning something from scripture, what we want to do, not just scripture, whether you're trying to learn something so that you can share with somebody on the street and so forth, what you need to do is make sure that you have a robust understanding of the topic. And I think one of the most important things when it comes to this issue or any other is that I'm hoping that you are able to take what you get here. Take what you get from reading materials as well. You can go through some of our interviews that we've done on this subject as well and use those things to help communicate them to your fellow believers to bring edification to the body or to simply be able to share the gospel with someone or correct an error on the street or correct an error with a brother in Christ. And one of the most important things is to understand what our authority is. Where do we go back to Are we supposed to go with our feelings and what our heart tells us? And that is our standard. What my heart tells me, that's where I should go. I don't believe that's a good idea. Jeremiah 17 is very clear on that, that the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? So I want to make sure that we have a good understanding of what is our authority. Should we trust whatever the church has to say? You know, we had Dr. Craig Evans on our show talking about Jesus in the manuscripts, and he was actually interviewed by Hank Hanegraaff, who has more more recently become orthodox in his line of thinking. And when they were talking about the longer ending of Mark and whether or not that should be in Scripture, instead of appealing to what was true and, and so forth, what kind of appeal do you think Hank Hanegraaff made? He said, well... The Orthodox Church says that the ending of Mark is in there, so I just believe that. And so that's his authority. So what we have here is to say, where is our authority? And I believe all authority when it comes to what you believe, what you teach, how you come to faith, and how you're supposed to walk in Christ, it is supposed to come from Scripture. And I say this not just as just throwing this out there as my opinion, but I believe this is exactly what the scriptures teach. And I believe they teach this by way of not only a logical deduction, but when we read the scriptures in their nature, what the scriptures are is what specifically tells us who they're from. What the scriptures are, and specifically we're going to talk about those, what the scriptures are by their nature tells us that they are scripture. And I know that sounds like circular reason, but we're going to get into that when it comes to reading the scriptures and what they have to say. Now, when we get into the word of God, I think 
starting, we're in a new, we're New Testament, New Covenant believers, so it's a great place to start is, what did Jesus say concerning the scriptures, even the ones of Old Testament? And I think, as once again, we could talk about when the canon came to be and, and so forth. And I'm not going to do that for this episode. We have two episodes that we'll put in the description. We talked to Dr. Michael J. Kruger on that, and there's a number of resources you can get from him that are excellent on that subject. The question of, of canon, canon revisited, as well as heresy and ortho, uh, the heresy of orthodoxy. All three of those books, excellent books on the subject, and we've had him on as a guest. If you want data books in terms of what was accepted and so forth and when, and the information in terms of manuscripts, you can listen to the interview we did with Dr. Craig Evans. We'll also put that in the description. That as well, you, you can check out his book, Jesus and the Manuscripts, and other books he's read, written on the subject. So we're not going to dig into that. I want to teach, I want to talk about what the scriptures say on this subject, because ultimately that's most important, because I do believe scriptures are, are, are the authority that we need to appeal to. What are you appealing to? Are you going to appeal to the church as Catholics do? Did the church decide what the scriptures were? Or are the scriptures self-authenticating? Are the scriptures, I believe in a scriptural understanding of canon that's ontological by its being, because of what it is, Therefore, the canon is the word of God. And I'm going to read that in the scriptures because this is exactly what Jesus believed. And in Matthew chapter 22, he is specifically shows us that he believes that the words that we read on those these pieces of paper that we have or digitally online or however you read it, that those words that were written a long time ago were written not simply for that person or by, even by that person necessarily, but they were written and spoken to you by God himself. And I will prove that here in Matthew 22, starting at verse 23. It said, on that day, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us and the first married and died and having no children left his wife to his brother. So also the second and the third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. And in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they had all been married. Now, you see, this is a, what, what they call this argument is a reductio ad absurdum, that they want to reduce your answer down to absurdity. So what the, I would guess that the Sadducees probably used this over and over against the Pharisees who did believe in a resurrection and did believe in angels and so forth. And I think that they probably got them on this over and over again. And this is really important for us to look at because Jesus is going to give them an answer. By the way, uh, Jesus doesn't say, well, they're just polygamists, right? Uh, so there's a reason why he doesn't isn't able to answer it that way because he knows that God designed, according to Matthew chapter 19, God designed for one man and one woman to be together. So here he's going to answer them. And so pay attention to the wordage because it's really, really important. It says, but Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given to marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, oh man, I love Jesus. <laughs> he's, gonna, he's just going to put him right here on the floor. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And then he quotes Exodus. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And this is really, really important because of a couple things he does here. Notice that he says, have you, speaking to these Pharisees, over a thousand years after Moses wrote those words, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? He was holding the Pharisees accountable to the word of God as if God was speaking directly to them right then and right there and right now when he said it. And I believe he could say the same exact thing to you as well. And also, let's pay attention to the argument here. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Notice he is using. Notice that he is using the tense of a verb to show that, guess what? When God said that, he was currently the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
They weren't just dead. They weren't just in the ground and so forth. He was currently, because he is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. And Jacob was still living. So another thing that takes place when we look at this, we recognize, obviously, Jesus points out, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? This is something we should write in our hearts and recognize that when these words were written down, ultimately, God God is speaking to us through them. He holds them accountable, not just Moses, not just the Israelites at that time, but them right there, those Pharisees, those Sadducees specifically, they were being held accountable to the word of God, which he said they did not know. And I want to point this out because the apostles also knew that they had such authority to write scriptures and to teach in such a manner when Jesus gave them that authority. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For this reason we also constantly thank God that you receive the word of God, which you heard from us. What did you hear from them? The word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. The apostles were not ignorant about their authority when they wrote those scriptures that Christ had given them on this earth. It is very, very clear they had a good understanding exactly what the scriptures were. And in fact, 2 Peter makes it clear concerning Paul's letters. And and I love this. I I want to bring this out because I I think this is really, really important when we put all of 2 Peter together on this, because we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 after going to 2 Peter chapter 3. Because remember, and I love this, because think about how God used this in such a powerful way to show us something. Paul and Peter, you remember the book of Galatians, that Paul, at one point, rebuked Peter to his face, right? Said he stood condemned for the way he was acting, right? Acting aloof towards the Gentiles when the Jews would come around and so forth. This same Peter, who was called out so that other people wouldn't be condemned as well, in front of other men, right? This same Peter right here then says this of Paul's writings. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, who? Beloved brother Paul, all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the graphe, the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Now, Peter is saying Paul's words and letters, those which are written, which can be hard to understand, are to be put in the same light as the other scriptures. This is important because in this very same letter, this is what Peter has to say about the scriptures. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we do not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, such an utterance as this was made by him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Well, what is he talking about? What could Peter be talking about? Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. That's my Jesus. (laughs) And his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. This is a radical thing that's taking place on the Mount of Transfiguration here. I mean, you can't get around this. This is radical. They're seeing Jesus who they've been walking with shining like the sun in its strength. They're seeing Moses and Elijah, the picture of the law and the prophets. All of this is going on right before their very eyes. They get to see this. 
Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now there's a whole, I believe, a picture of one of the feasts as well that one of the reasons that Peter's doing this, but I don't want to, I don't think he's just randomly asking to make tents, but I'm not going to get into that right now because that's not what I'm talking about. Maybe that's for another episode with Joe. Uh, while he was speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their face to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. This is the event that Peter is describing in 2 Peter that they didn't follow cleverly devised tales. They were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Pretty majestic when Jesus shines like the sun in his strength, right? Pretty majestic when God the Father speaks to them from the clouds. Think about that. You have God the Father speaking to them from the clouds. What could be more powerful than that? What could be more sure than the voice of God speaking from the clouds? Well, he follows this up back again to 2 Peter. And we ourselves, speaking of that event, and we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven and when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a light, uh, a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in our hearts. In your hearts. But know this first of all that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Once again, we are dealing once again with the nature of Scripture, the fact that God is the one who gave it. And when Peter talks about Scripture, mind you, in the same letter, he says of Paul's letter that they are also scripture. And in that very same letter, equating the two, he says that the scriptures that we have today, including Paul's letters, the scriptures we have today are more sure than God speaking from the clouds, than a voice from the clouds. Can you even picture that in your head? Man, that should make us want to memorize scripture, right? When I think about that, when I think about him saying that, that these words that we have are more sure than literally, forget, we've talked about cloud writing, right? And all these different things. Like, you know, for me to move somewhere, it would pretty much take cloud writing. We are talking about hearing a voice from heaven. And then that same Peter who heard that, not following cleverly devised tales, that same Peter that, that heard that says, we have a word more sure. Do you realize what we have in the scriptures? And to make it even more clear, we'll go to 2 Timothy. And I love this because a lot of people go right to 2 Timothy 3.16 to speak about the nature of scripture as theanustos, something that is God-breathed. But I think it's even more powerful when we look back and look at the context of of 2 Timothy. And if you remember 2 Timothy 3, most people remember, and depending on what Bible you have, it'll say difficult times will come or perilous times will come. But remember, and what's great is we're going to get the problem and the anecdote. And how, and you imagine 2 Timothy being a letter from Paul, almost like a living eulogy not long before he dies, writing to a young pastor who he has yearned up and grown in his faith. And you think about this. If you had something to say, if you had a letter to write to someone you love to keep the faith, and what would you say? One of the coolest things is when it comes to that which is theonistos, that which is God breathed, we actually know what one of the disciples, one of the apostles, I'm sorry, one of the apostles would specifically write if he was writing to someone he loved who he had grown in the faith. And if you're not meditating on 2 Timothy, I encourage you to right now, because this has been a book over and over again when I read it and recognize that God has used men to write these words over and over again. He's even used their life experience when he used them to write it. And when I see this, I think to myself over and over again, I want to be somebody that can write and encourage or talk and encourage 
these young believers, knowing that I'm going to die one day, knowing what would I say, and I can say I know what God would say using Paul to a young Timothy. And here's what he has to say. But realize this, in the last days, difficult times or perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. From among them are those who enter into households and and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected in regard of the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. So that sets up a very, very important scripture for us as believers. A very, very important scripture when it comes to the nature of God's word. Because we are talking about Paul's letter to somebody he is discipling, and he is explaining to them something wicked stuff is going to come. Wicked stuff is going to come. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to be really bad. But guess what Paul does? Paul doesn't just give him whining and complaining. And if you turn on too much conservative radio, that's pretty much all you're going to get with no anecdote, right? But that's not what we do here at Good Fight Radio. We want to have the antidote. And Paul wanted Timothy to know what his antidote is. And it's, you know, something you see in scripture in 2 Peter as well in Jude. Though you know all these things, I desire to remind you. Even if we know these things, it's always good to be reminded. I know that is for me, When I share the gospel with someone, I always think about that. When I'm sharing the gospel with someone and I remember that God's word never comes back void, when I remember when I'm sharing the gospel with someone and Philemon verse six says, I pray you're active in sharing your faith, you have a full understanding of every good thing you have in Christ. When I recognize that and I see that, I recognize that sometimes when I'm sharing the gospel, that's because God is reminding me of the goodness that he, just the greatness of who he is and what he's done for me. You know, it's the same thing. And when you start talking even about your wife, right, your spouse, and you start reminding, you telling people, yeah, it's amazing all the work she does at home and taking care of my kids and, and she still does this and all this stuff. I'm reminded, man, I really do have it really good, let alone with my Savior. I love bragging about him. The psalmist, David, specifically in Psalm 40, talked about when he would sing a new song, this song of praise to his God, guess what would happen? Many will hear of it and come to fear and put their trust in the Lord. And so, I I like to think about that and how I'm going to share and how I'm going to share the gospel with people. And it's really, really important. So when I look at this, let's recognize not only to be able to use these verses that God has given us, and and I'm going to, I want to share with you, these verses were given specific instructions on what scripture in its nature is supposed to do for us and what we're supposed to be doing with scripture. And so Paul has laid it out. All this terrible stuff is going to happen. What's the antidote? Verse 10. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, and and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know, you don't see a lot of those on, you know, uh, mugs and stuff when you when you when you're looking at people's houses, right? It's usually Jeremiah 29:11, Philippians 4:13, but uh, you know, 2 Timothy 3:12, I, I think a lot of people may not use that one. It says this though. Uh, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things which you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ. The sacred writings, the scriptures are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation in Christ. Verse 16, for all scripture is God-breathed, theonoustos, inspired by God and profitable for teaching teaching 
What should you be teaching with? The Word of God. Not a bunch of stories about what you did over the weekend. Let's teach from the Word of God. For reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This, why can it do all these things? Why is it sufficient to be able to do all these things? Because it's the anustas. So that the man of God may, we, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You see, the scriptures, because of their nature, because God is the one who had breathed them, because of that, guess what? They are adequate for us. They are sufficient. The scriptures we have been given by God himself, that which he has given us, a more sure word than somebody speaking from the clouds, a more sure word, this prophetic utterance, not written just by men. God used men to write it, but ultimately he's the one who wrote wrote it. I wrote down my notes for this show on my computer. I would never say and say, you know, it was all my computer who did it all. That's silly. I'm the one, I'm the mind behind it to get this word out there. And I'm not saying that Paul and Peter and such were amatons. That's not what scriptural inerrancy, that's not what sola scriptura, that's not what any of these doctrines teach. And don't let someone caricature you out of understanding that the scriptures are our final authority. If you begin to take and say the church is now our authority or the consensus opinion at one given time of the church is our authority or some council or creed is our authority for the scriptures, you're off on the wrong foot and you're coming at it backwards. Understanding how God used the church and his people because the people of God are people that are the, are his sheep and his sheep hear his voice and they don't follow another. Understanding that, that God was going to use his voice and his sheep throughout history so that we would know exactly what we're supposed to have, that does not define that which is God-breathed. What defines that which is God-breathed is God breathing it, right? When Moses wrote down that God created the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth were not created because Moses wrote that down. Therefore, also, when it comes to something that God creates, when John, before the ink was dry on the Gospel of John, it was already Theonustos. Before the ink was dry on 2 Peter, it was already Theonustos. If anyone tells you that the church had to decide that for you, they're simply wrong. And the, it, the, the scriptures themselves self-authenticate. Because Jesus also, when we look at it, and we can appeal to Jesus through his word over and over again, we recognize the power that scripture has in our sanctification very clearly, John 17, 17, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. We recognize, as we just read, the, that scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. We recognize the power of the scriptures. And I would tell you this, I am weary of anybody who says they are a believer and doesn't have a love for the word of God and would denigrate it. And if you try to use some church counselor or so forth to walk the dog, so to speak, that they can push and say, well, whatever the scripture says in light of the church, that's wrong too. We want to make sure that we look at things in light of scripture, recognize its authority over our life, and recognize that we use it for what? What does it say here? For teaching, reproof, correction, and the training in righteousness, because this word is theonustos. God bless.